Emily Dickinson, the great, uh, amazing mother of American poetry, and also one of the most confounding and difficult mysteries in the history of literature. Uh, she's somebody who uh, the vast, vast majority of her work was not published during her lifetime. Uh, the majority of her poems in giant uh, piles of them, uh, many of them bound up in fascicles or tied up with string, were found after she died. She'd requested uh, all of her papers to be burned after she died, but of course her sister disobeyed her and with the help of some other people uh, worked to publish her uh, posthumously and now she's known as one of the most influential and revolutionary uh, poets or writers of any type uh, who has ever lived. Uh, there's this classic conception of Dickinson as being this sort of creepy, weird woman in white who was a total shut-in. Uh, and that's partially true. She was somewhat isolated uh, later in life. She didn't uh, like to go out much. She didn't really seek a lot of fame or attribution in her own life. But she did, in fact, travel uh, when she was young. So she wasn't a, a lifelong recluse. Uh, she also, uh, even when older, wrote a lot of letters. Uh, so she definitely had social correspondence. She wasn't uh, a hermit by any means. Um, she is, though, a, an endless mystery uh, because she wasn't publishing a bunch during her lifetime. She didn't leave any sort of autobiography, you know, and she wasn't somebody who uh, cavorted about with a bunch of other writers. So it's very difficult to really get an idea of who she was as a person. And, of course, the poems uh, don't necessarily help to shed much light on that because of how complicated they are uh, they're undeniably brilliant, but they're also, in many ways, very uh, obscure and difficult for many people to understand. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you uh, had difficulties with her. Uh, I know personally that uh, Dickinson gave me great struggles for a long time, and it's only been within the last couple years that I started to be able to digest her meaning a little bit. Uh, her work is a lot like uh, they're little tiny puzzles. Uh, in a sense, and you sort of need to work your way through them and consider them uh, and debate over them yourself to sort of crack open the meaning. Uh, there are just three poems of hers that we are going to be addressing. Uh, one, I heard a fly buzz when I died, uh, is one of my favorites. Uh, each line in this poem sort of compounds the uh, message of the prior lines. Uh, so as you go through with it, I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. Uh, so it's like, it's a situation in which somebody is on a deathbed, uh, a first person someone, we can proxy that as Emily, uh, the narrator, uh, is on the deathbed and everybody's there. Uh, everybody has cried, you know, uh, the eyes around had wrung them dry. So uh, nobody's crying anymore because it's, to the point where the death is inevitable. Uh, all the keepsakes have been willed away. Uh, the king be witnessed. So like the idea of God or the absolute uh, has been witnessed in the room. Uh, everything has been willed away. And at this moment of death, uh, there interposed a fly with blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz between the light and me. And then the windows failed and then I could not see to see. So this is a thing where you sort of need to imagine it uh, yourself. So you're here, you're on your deathbed, you're about to die, you've already willed everything away, uh, all the crying is done, and now it's just a matter of waiting. And at that moment, at that moment, right when you are dying, a fly buzzes. So between the light and me, so it's at the moment that the light of heaven is being seen, and there a fly comes in. And it's literally the last thought is a fly. Uh, so what does this mean? Obviously to us, uh, you know, a fly represents in many ways uh, death or the end or even something grotesque or, you know, unpalatable. And it's certainly not the last thing you'd want to be considering. Uh, but in a way, it's also a profoundly appropriate thing to be considering uh, while on your deathbed. So, and then the windows failed, okay? So the sight fails, 
you know, death has happened, and then I could not see to see. So quite literally, uh, it is uh, this fly buzzing is the end of the road. And I think it's a, a really sort of fantastic, strange little poem. Uh, the next one up is This World is Not Conclusion, which is a pretty interesting one where it's the idea is that death is not the end here. Uh, like she says, like music, you know, invisible as music, but positive as sound. So uh, the afterlife, in a way, uh, even though like music, it cannot be seen, uh, that does not mean that it is not there. Uh, at this point, philosophy and sagacity or uh, wisdom, uh, these things are gone. They cannot give the answers. You know, there's faith is slipping. There are gestures uh, from the pulpit, but they uh, don't get the job done. Uh, as a means, it says, uh, faith slips, plucks at a twig of evidence. So some evidence of an afterlife uh, and asks a vein the way. So a weather vein, obviously by looking at it, you can see which way the wind is blowing. Uh, but also uh, at the same time, you can, you can see what the cardinal directions are, but then it also is a vein. So this is sort of a clever wordplay on Dickinson's part to suggest that uh, to seek evidence is vanity, that it itself uh, is a vain thing to do. So in many ways, this poem is about doubt. The idea that narcotics cannot still the tooth that nibbles at the soul. Uh, so that no matter what, you know, there, there isn't uh, necessarily an answer. One other thing I want to bring up here is that when the poems were found after her death uh, and they were edited, there were many changes made. You might have noticed that there were some strange things about the way these poems were put together. There are lots of weird dashes. Um, there are actually, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of really strange capitalizations, and actually the original versions were untitled. Uh, you probably noticed that the titles listed here uh, are just the first lines of the poem. So there were efforts made to make this work uh, more approachable for people, such as getting rid of the odd capitalization and replacing many of the dashes either with nothing or with periods or commas. One thing that's interesting in regards to this world is not conclusion is that there, in the last line, we get all these words capitalized, right? We get pulpit capitalized, we get gesture capitalized, we get vein capitalized, and all of these are something symbolizing the importance. But then very, very pronouncedly in the last line, the word soul is not capitalized, which is, uh, you know, a questionable thing. And it's the type of thing where, man, it sure would be fantastic to go back and ask Emily Dickinson, why she didn't capitalize the word soul. Uh, but one reason why she's so profoundly fascinating is the fact that we cannot go back and ask her that. We're just stuck uh, trying to wonder whether that was a purposeful thing. What's she trying to say about the soul uh, by not capitalizing it there? The last poem we have to deal with is one of her most famous poems. I felt a funeral in my brain. Uh, this is a very tough piece, and people have come up with a lot of different meanings for it. The idea that this is uh, an example of a, a headache or a migraine, uh, that this is an example of uh, somebody dying or somebody descending into insanity. Uh, these are all possibilities, that heavens were a bell and being but an ear, you know, where it's like the, the absolute, the universe, that death is there. Uh, the idea at the end that uh, you know, and then a plank in reason broke. And then I heard him lift a box and creak across my soul, where quite literally that box could be a coffin with the person in it, and the plank in reason could be the coffin breaking. Uh, there are a lot of different possibilities out there, but it's another example of a poem where you can just consider a lot of things. Uh, the most beautiful part of this poem, though, I think, is the end. And then a plank in reason broke, and I dropped down and down, and hit a world at every plunge, and finished knowing then. Where it's like that idea at the end, that when the plank in reason breaks, uh, which of course could symbolize death, it could symbolize insanity, you know, any of these types of things, that at that point, the knowing is over, and it's only the question. There is one strange thing, though, is that in one manuscript, uh, that line in finished knowing then is not the end of the poem. There is actually an extra line on there.
that says crash got through. So you have to consider, and this is something I want you to debate on your own, what necessarily uh, is changed by the idea of having that extra line. So rather than it being in finished knowing then versus in finished knowing then, crash got through. So if you have that second one on there, it gives it sort of a, a maybe a less bleak idea that with the crash, you get through to the other side, you're in heaven or you're in insanity or whatever. You sort of succumbed to this other thing that is there. So the thing is, is that without Dickinson here to tell us uh, what to do with her work, we're just sort of left to stumble through it on our own. And that's one reason why she's been so ripe for scholarship. And there have been many different things written. Uh, two incredibly famous uh, contemporary American poets have both written uh, things called My Emily Dickinson, where they have attempted to try to understand who this woman is and what exactly she's trying to mean. But ultimately, uh, her work is very, uh, you know, consolidated. It's very concise. It's very, very opposed to the Whitman mode, right? Whitman is effusive and boisterous and crazy and, you know, ranting and raving from the rooftops. Uh, and so he's sort of the father of American poetry and representing that pole. We have Emily on the other side, very tiny uh, lyric poems, uh, very inscrutable, very much something that you have to sit there and study and consider and contemplate and debate uh, with yourself to sort of figure out uh, what they all amount to. But ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, Emily Dickinson is somebody who you might struggle with, but if you give her the time, uh, the rewards are profound.